time to build a new Game Boy Advance with a laminated IPS screen. Hi and welcome back to The Shed. I'm Joe Bleeps. It is a rainy, miserable morning, but we've got the new IPS laminated kit from Funny Playing here. I'm going to install it in one of their custom shells. I've got it in white, got a bunch of black buttons, should get that kind of Stormtrooper effect. I did a similar build recently with the ITA TFT screen, which is slightly different. So it'll be awesome to do a build with the IPS and then we'll do a bit of a comparison between the two later. So yeah, looking forward to this build. Let's take a look. Okay, so this is my ITA TFT screen I installed a little while ago. I will link the video for that one up here if you want to have a look. But this was the first time I've done a laminate kit in a Game Boy Advance. Now laminated means that the glass lens is actually attached to the screen itself which means that the screen is closer to the lens, it means that there is no chance of dust getting in the gaps and it looks super professional looks really nice. This one is actually a screen from a DSi. You can see the pixels up close, it's pixel perfect but it's a little bit smaller and not quite as bright and vibrant as the IPS displays. Speaking of which I have now got the kit for the laminated version of the IPS also made by Funny Playing. I got this one from Retro Gaming Parts in the UK. They also operate as Perth Retro Gaming. Um, either way, definitely worth a look. They've got loads of cool stuff on their site. And this kit I was particularly excited about. Um, so it's like it's the same kind of thing as this, but with a different screen. So we'll take a look at what I got and a couple of little caveats if you're thinking of doing one of these builds. The main one is that these screens, they kind of will fit in an original Game Boy Advance shell, but there is a lot of cutting and it would be very fiddly, very tricky, very frustrating and very hard to get accurate. So what you need is one of Funny Playing's Repro shells. It's specifically made for this kit so you know that this will just drop in and fit and it comes with decent screws, it comes with the LED light pipe and I've also bought some buttons for it. So I've gone for a kind of Stormtrooper look with this one. So I've got the white shell, I've got some black silicon parts for going underneath the buttons and also the start and select and I've got black strips for the side and black buttons, black shoulder buttons should look really good. There's also a bracket that comes with the screen kit that will sort of uh, locate it correctly in place and there is a little sticker for going on the back and I got some retro gaming parts stickers as well. Right, so in order to do this build I'm pretty sure that all I will need is a couple of screwdrivers and also if I'm doing some soldering a little later with some wires and things I'll need my soldering iron of course but we'll need a crosshead screwdriver for the inside of the Game Boy Advance and a uh, tri-wing for the outer shell. Of course, you will also need a Game Boy Advance. I've got here the one that I uh, revived in my last video. Again, if you wanna watch that one, I'll try and remember to put a link, but this one was absolutely dead. It had the most <laughs> destroyed shell I've seen in a long time. And I replaced all the capacitors on the motherboard and it is running like new now. So this is the Game Boy that's gonna go inside this shell and it's gonna have the screen replaced. It's gonna be dead good. So let's make a start. Right, first things first, I think I'll just open everything up and take a look at what we've got. Uh, so the shell itself is in a sealed bag. It has the bag with all of the screws that we need. Actually, last time it turned out, these were really good screws. The slightly different length ones are actually crosshead in this kit and the other ones are tri-wing. So it's, it's authentic as the original Game Boy. So the front shell has a little bevel on the inside edge so the screen just drops in and holds in place. Obviously there's the back shell that will fit against that. We also need to use this bracket which will fit within the inside of this space uh, to just hold the screen in position. There's like little lugs inside the shell that locate on those. Again, another reason why you want the custom shell and not just try and hack up your own Game Boy because it's, it's just not gonna end well. There is another kit that Funny Playing have brought out that is designed for using with original shells, like a drop-in kit. I'm hopefully gonna be covering that very soon as well. So in the meantime, this one with the laminated IPS screen, you do really have to have the custom shell. Thankfully, the shells from Funny Playing are really good quality. Same as this one that I've got here. This one's been fantastic. I've been playing it quite a lot. It's just as good as the original. Definitely better than a lot of repro shells that I've used. Right, let's take a look inside the IPS kit. If you can't stand the texture of foam, you're not in luck. There's a little uh, backing bit for locating the screen. So the screen has a little cover on it. You'll need to get that out when you drop it into the shell because you've got that beveled edge that's going to need to engage so there's the screen itself is actually mounted onto the lens and has a little attachment ribbon 
there and then inside the bag there are also wires the wires last time were great i didn't have to use any of my own so i'll be using these very very thin red wires we've got three in there you don't necessarily have to do the wire soldering that's there to help with brightness adjustment that you could do by like holding select and pressing the l and r buttons which i think is a really cool touch so i'm going to be doing that but if you're doing this build you can just drop the screen in and, and off you go and then there is this ribbon here which will attach to the screen through this connector here it's got two possible options because with a game boy advance you can either have a 32 pin or a 40 pin connector on the motherboard so the first thing i'm going to do is is remove the motherboard from the Game Boy Advance so all I need to do for that is take out the batteries take out the game cartridge and start removing screws we've got one two three four five six we've got seven on the outer shell and then we've got a couple on the inside as well that's the screws out remove the back shell we won't be needing that and remove the shoulder buttons they'll just pull out side panels will just lift out and then you've got a screw over here both of these are crosshead screws you've got one over here one over here sometimes one here so in this instance i've just got the two then there is the power switch to just lift out and we've got the ribbon attached to the screen so i'll just lift these two little bits here you can use a spudger or thumbnails if you've got them that clip just slides this way and then the ribbon will remove quite easily as you lift out the motherboard uh, the motherboard has got the silicon parts attached there but i've got all new silicon parts all new buttons so this whole shell can now move out of the way and all i'm gonna do now is my speaker has a little bit of dust on it you've got the little speaker grill there so dust can get in there over the years i'll just take a little soft brush and gently brush away the dust from the speaker alternatively um you can buy new speakers which in hindsight might have been a good thing to do if you're one of those people who's not keen on soldering though just stick with your original speaker that should be clean enough now you can't see it um but it just will sound a little bit better if it's clear while it's open i'll check all my contacts i did test this game boy already yesterday and it was good um but what you can do is just take a pencil eraser you may as well while it's open and just rub over the contacts for your start select up down left right a and b buttons and seeing as i got my brush handy i'll just sweep off any bits there so my motherboard is now all good to go and i may as well do a quick clean on the cartridge connectors there as well while it's open right so this is the heart of our game boy what else do we need so this is our new front shell this is going to sit face down and the first thing i need to do is take my new screen and my ribbon and start to get all my stuff in place there now this ribbon here is going to fold over and have the new board attached to it so i think it might be easier to get that in place first so this is one of the type where you've got to like lift up it's like a little levered latch on top then the ribbon slots into that gap make sure it's fully seated hold it seated while you flip the top down that is now located in place this will fold over and sit on the back of my screen and the screen if i just take off the covering from the lens there will sit in the bottom of the shell like that so if i lift up there You'll see it's a flush fit with the top of the case particularly once it's all pushed in place so that is in position here i could stick that down with a bit of tape when i checked my motherboard and it was the 0411 code uh, i went back and checked on the comments from my previous build video and eugene romero my old friend gene boy commented that if you look through that little gap in the opening by the battery cover you've got a number and if it starts with a zero it means you've got a 40 pin board and if it starts with a one it means you've got a 32 pin board so this one of mine was 0411 which means it's a 40 pin board that's the one where the ribbon is already lined up so hopefully that'll be a bit easier this time if you've got a 32 pin that will fold back on itself 
itself and then you're using this ribbon here but this one I think I might just I don't know whether you're supposed to cut it off but I would rather just fold it and move it out of the way that way if this ends up needing to be taken out and put on a different motherboard I've got the uh, the ribbon available so anyway yeah 40 pin for us which is that one next thing I need to do is to get this bit of foam here and trim it to fit around this part here so it's basically got to cover the gap where your lens fits in place. I do one long bit that kind of fits along the bottom here and get that in. And then another one that goes up the side, all taken from lengthwise. Trying to get it to fit in this gap. Maybe I would have been better putting the sponge down before sticking this bit, but it's not the end of the world. Right, so that bit just squishes in there. And then I'll do another strip to go up the side. That way it's going to be longer, which means it'll cover more of, of what I need to. And I don't think you need any adhesive for this. It just squidges in place. I need to just trim a tiny bit off the top there. Going to wreak havoc with my speaker later, but we'll see how we go. So that's just in there. That's in place there. So that was easier than cutting an L shape, doing like two separate bits like that. Right, next we've got some soldering to do if you are interested in adding some wires. I'd forgotten to switch on my soldering iron, which is annoying, but never mind. Right, so while my soldering iron's warming up, I've been thinking about what to do with these ribbons. Uh, so I'm using the 40 pin one, which means that this one, the 32, needs to be out of the way. So I've folded it over, but obviously we've got all these bare contacts there. We don't want those touching the back of the screen. So I'll put some capped on tape over there. Any tape will do, but the capped on being an insulator, it's pretty handy. So that will go there, this will fold down. In fact, what I think I'll do is just get an extra bit of tape just to hold that ribbon securely in place like that and just keep that out of the way for when we're doing our build. Hopefully that won't cause us any problems, but if it does, we can always revisit with that. Okay, so I've got a number of different solder connections on here. Got it labeled as L, R and SEL for select. So I'll need to get a bit of solder on each of these and add the wires that came with the kit. So it's these three red wires. They are already stripped and tinned, so it saves you loads of time. It's probably a good idea to put a little bit of flux on the three points where I'm adding some solder as well. So a little bit of flux on those. So this is for the brightness control. Uh, you can get away with not using that, not really much of an issue. If you don't want the brightness control, you just will have it set to maximum brightness for the whole time, I think. So that's not gonna to be too much of a problem. But I like soldering, so it's it's not an issue to me. And if you are one of those people who go, oh, I'm not keen on, on doing one of those jobs with the soldering, trust me, soldering is so much fun. You're missing out. It's definitely worth learning and it's not as difficult as you might think it is. But anyway, so what I need to do is briefly heat each of these little spots and add a little bit of solder as the iron is in contact with it and that will just stick to the pad. So one, two, three. So it's like a three step process. It will only stick to hot metal. So you heat up the little point, you keep the iron on there to keep it hot, you dab on the solder which will instantly melt onto the surface and then you leave the iron on, give it a chance to flow into a little ball like we see there and you'll have that little blob in place. Now I need to attach my wires. So I'm gonna turn it around this way because I want to route my wires in this direction. All I need to do, I'll line up my wire, I'll melt the solder Feed the wire into the position, hold the heat on, and then move away. I'll do that three times. Should be patient with it. Okay, so those three wires are now in position. They need attaching onto the motherboard. Now, before I get too carried away, I've just remembered that there is this plastic part. It must be something to do with the mold on this case. So when the uh, EXT, the link cable connector goes in place, obviously this bit needs to be out of the way. So I'll just use some snips to trim that out of the way. There we go, that just popped straight off. That was easy. All right, so on the motherboard, we need to connect wires for select and L and R. On here, I'm looking for TP8. Again, flux is definitely your friend in terms of getting the solder in the right place. So I just have this, this liquid flux. And it's really handy and I've had it for years. It lasts a long time. So TP8 on this side. On the other side, we are looking for TP9. And then for select, that's just down here, TP2, I think. So. I will put the solder on before the wires, just like I did on the ribbon. Okay, 
This wire is my select, so that will go to TP2. soldered in place. Looking at this obviously we can see the A and B buttons and left right up down so this is the front so that would be the left side so that'll be the L button so this one is L so that one will come across to here and then on this side I've got TP8. Turn the whole assembly round and then I've got a better angle. So again, you just use the little point where the solder is, move the wire in position, hold it steady and that sits nice and firm. So I am going to have to try and route these. First, I've got some buttons. So let's see what I've got. All the buttons there and there's also these two little pins. If I look at an existing spring, there's like a little nub that sticks out there that is kind of away from the button. So there's my L button there. There's a little opening where that tab goes. Both the tabs are the same, so I'll make sure that the nub is facing outwards in the same way. Line up with the little groove, slot it in place. That just slotted straight in actually, didn't need the pliers. I'll just see if it'll push in a little further. Now it's quite a loose fit on this kit, it was tighter last time. Again, fix it the right way around, slot it in place. And again, that one just pretty much dropped straight in. I'm not sure whether it should be a loose fit. Does it stick out further? Looks about the same amount as the original. Yeah, pushing in doesn't seem to knock it in position, so that should just be fine. But let's take a look at the silicon bits I bought. Mainly got it for the start and select buttons because your standard start and select aren't like the plastic kits. The, it's just the silicon bit that pokes right through. Your D-pad has like a little nub in the middle, so that matches up and kind of pushes and connects onto there. Spend a bit of time pushing that on there and it kind of locks over. There we go, so that sits a bit better now. Right, so with all the buttons ready to go and I've got my foam bits and bobs in place here, next thing to do before we put the actual motherboard in place is to get our bracket. Okay, now that's this bit here. It will locate in what seems to be the pretty obvious place like that. Looking at what I have done though, I think I would have been better to attach the wires after putting the bracket in place and then the bracket will sit solid without pinching any wires. So I'm gonna undo those. I will try and remember to put a warning in the video to not do these wires too soon. Clearly my soldering iron was still switched on. I mean, even if you did solder those in place, unsoldering them is dead easy, so it's not a problem, but my apologies. Right, so now let's get that bracket the right way around. It will click in position. Now there's this tab here that kind of hooks under a part on the shell there, and that will lock in place there so that goes under these two bits line up there that goes in position there and it all sits nice and flat and because it's hooked under there that kind of locates it in place so it lifts off slightly but when the motherboard and everything else is put in position that's not going to be an issue i'm going to resolder my wires now we can put all of our buttons in place and start to get this together. So when the shell goes on, it will push the bracket down in place. There's nothing to really lock it. And the sponge parts just give us a, an extra little bit of resistance. So when you're attaching the silicon parts, the D-pad actually has a little hole in the middle. Uh, with a little knob that, that clips in place so that locks in position so we'll get that and just make sure our holes are lined up to locate it I'm gonna lift this slightly just because obviously your buttons will stick out at the front the bracket has a little bit of a, a recess for the silicon parts to be accommodated so it's best to put the bracket in and then the buttons because they will sit above the bracket like we've got there A and B buttons to go on the other side A first B you don't have to worry about the shoulder buttons just yet but we do need to open up our screw pack almost forgot because within our set of screws we also have the little light pipe for the power led so that will just attach on here before the whole thing goes together almost forgot we also need the silicon pads to go on top of the a and b button that's normally one of my favorite things to forget when i'm reassembling a game boy advance again if i lift it slightly it'll allow everything to just sit in place i'll bring over my motherboard and um, first thing I'm gonna have to do is try and get this speaker I'll bring it away a little bit so that I can get it in place underneath the foam on this side which is easier said than done but if I start with that 
of everything else should be quite easy get that in position there then the motherboard on top and everything else should go in fine now looking at my ribbon it's not quite lined up with the motherboard that will mean that when i attached it to the screen earlier i must have slightly positioned it wrong so it might be better without faffing about with all that tape it shouldn't be too much trouble to take out and sort so i'll just remove my bracket move that cap down tape from the top lift off that where i've got the double-sided tape it's been a bit awkward to peel off so i'll just put the covering back on it right let's get that back together try and line up around all the buttons and look at where that ribbon is now it's a much better position i have got issues with all of the wires being a pain though to tape them out of the way but I think I can just carefully tweeze them out of the way. Tweezing a word? They are tweezers. I assume you use them for tweezing but now I'm saying it out loud I'm doubting myself. So wires are now out of the way. Let's make sure that one's well out of the way of the d-pad there and the other ones with the A and B are all out of the way. That should be okay. That just sits in position. Looks like we're all good and it looks like our ribbon is lined up a bit better now. While that's all in position I will get the shorter crosshead screw in place one here it's a new shell which means that we need to cut a little bit of a thread in it you do the right and left wiggle rather than just constantly screw all the way in you screw in a bit out a bit in a bit out a bit shake it all about a bit and that will locate for the last bit you can nip it up obviously as soon as you start to feel any resistance that's when you stop don't be tempted to to screw in further it'll end in tears because you'll strip the thread and then your screw can't get any purchase so that's those two in now those screws are in everything is in position we can inspect our screen it's aligned perfectly at the top in fact no it's sticking out a little bit at the top and it's not quite engaged at the bottom so what i'll need to do is try and apply a little bit of pressure at the bottom to just nudge that in same thing happened last time and everything sorts itself out in the end so that's just inside a little bit that side's fine this side not quite so i'll need some way to just apply a bit more pressure to the screen i mean there should be something pushing it down and when i'm, I'm looking at the bracket there's something i've done wrong d-pad feels all right the motherboard's up to the right spot maybe when the board itself is all screwed in position it'll be fine but this does feel like it's kind of pushing away a bit there's nothing to really lock it and the irony is that it's that kind of sponge layer that i put in that feels like it's pushing away but then the bracket pushes the screen in once it's all held firmly it actually sits flush so i am assuming always dangerous to assume i know but i am assuming that when it's together and screwed together everything should fit flat but that seems fine now i've got to try and get my ribbon in place which is going to be probably kind of awkward it feels very short actually um, i've just got to fold it over and get it into that holder and now i'm looking at it it might have been easier this is a pain it might have been easier to put it in and then flip it over because i can't quite get the reach to get that in place there try just moving it up a little bit there because it doesn't need much and then up and over and in place no 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 this feels like it's going to damage it so i'm going to undo my screws and i'll have to assemble the whole thing again just as a note i do like the funny playing kits but i'm using the instructions that were on their website for this and they are woeful so i might have been better doing one of these builds figuring out everything that they missed out in the instructions and then doing it again right so i'm gonna have to lift out the motherboard again and be careful of this ribbon in this instance uh, because it's kind of attached now i've got a little bit more movement what i can do is lift up my two connectors on the ribbon bring that over i've now got a lot more freedom of movement just locate that ribbon carefully in place down the connector tabs so yeah i know everything else is getting knocked out of position but you saw how awkward that was with the ribbon so now that's locked in we've got a good connection now i need to investigate what went wrong on the back so my bracket popped out so we're gonna have to put the bracket back in do the ips laminate they said it'll be easy they said <laughs> they were underestimating my incompetence right so that's in place here Get that out of the way Brackets in, buttons are in, not select, not in. Swing this over, we're gonna, it's so awkward because you've, you've got the ribbon there, but you've also got the link port thing and 
when you then flip that over if you if you've got the ribbon in position you're now putting undue strain on it by by trying to get the link port in place it's there's not really a an ideal way to do it it just largely feels like that ribbon is just that that little bit too short right i'm pretty much in position there my speaker's dropped in that's okay everything else is lined up and now i do have my ribbon in the right place everything seems okay don't seem to have any wires pinched that i can see just looking down there yeah that's all good right while the going is good let's get those screws in um so we've got this one on this side so i've already screwed these in once so i'm gonna have to keep turning it anti-clockwise until i feel a little pop and then i'll be able to screw that into the thread that i already created on my last attempt of putting this together and then on the other side i've got this one here again it's already got a thread so undo it until you feel it pop and then that'll just screw easily in position right so now i've got that in place my ribbon is secure it does feel tight i'll try just moving that up a little bit there just to alleviate that tension but it does feel quite tight um, which is a bit of a concern my corner here isn't quite located so that's just going to need to push and pop in position and same with that one there that's okay front inspection screen is not quite white fitted correctly at the top so i'll just give that a bit of pressure a bit of a wiggle there you go that's just popped in that's all flush there now and at the bottom not quite flush but again I just push that in position check give it a wiggle and a move around just to locate everything correctly and then i'm ready to assemble checking over my screws there is another short one so seeing as i've got the space there and seeing as this whole thing does need securing in position i will add an extra screw at this point here then we've got the back of the shell that's due to go on. I'll move the battery compartment out of the way. Put my shoulder buttons in position. So this is now from the back so that our button goes here here just locates the L button again with being careful with the tab there because yeah I don't want it to drop out. I don't know why they don't quite grip. They just seem like they're either not quite thick enough or the the bit to secure them isn't quite right but once it's in place hopefully it's going to be all right let's give it a quick test because if i hold it up here and and these bits drop out that's going to be a nuisance no that's okay got my power switch which will just go down here set in that off position just give that a quick check yeah that's fine and i've got my side bits don't know if they've got a correct name but side bits it is uh, one of them's got like an extra little protrusion that will sit in the gap on the motherboard there so you can tell which one is on the right side then i'll get the back just slotted on just check that everything locate usually your trigger buttons are going to be your issue and they'll, they'll just need a bit of a a wiggle to get them to locate properly like that one you heard the little pop there everything else seems to fit Okay, I did just feel that screen go in again there, but it should hopefully pop out afterwards. Right, so screws in place next. This time mostly tri-wing screws, and again I'm threading new holes, so make sure you're going in and out, not just screwing all the way in. That'll cut a much neater thread. That's obviously pushing apart a little bit at the bottom. It's not an issue. It's just because of that that sponge and the pressure of the bracket, which is supposed to nudge the screen right against the front to get a flush fit. So I'm going to get this black screw, which is a crosshead, and that goes in the central area of the bottom of the battery casing. And again, don't over tighten it, partly for the reason that you don't want it to strip the thread, but also you don't want it to burst out of the front. It is looking pretty nice, this actually, isn't it? Um, right, so my <laughs> my battery clip just fell out, so let's get that back in. Not very tight, secure fit with the metal parts on this set, is there? Then I've got my tri-wing again for the remaining four screws. That's pretty much flush all the way around. It feels a little bit more in at the bottom and a little bit out at the top. But if you can kind of, because the plastic's quite flexible, you can sort of massage it into place. There you go. So that's a really good fit all the way around. Start and select area seems to be the trickiest part. But yeah, a little bit of wiggling and then that fits. It's amazing. This is another advantage I didn't say before about that compared to the original. Like where this sits in, there was always like a little bit of a gap on the original and it sat in slightly with this it fits absolutely flush you, you can't see the join in there which is really nice right i've got a couple more screws to nip up just at the top now i have just remembered 
and this is very typical Joe and it I hopefully won't have to take anything apart so that should be all right um, I've just remembered that when I opened up all of my kits there was some form of warning label on there which said please test the screen before you install it um, yeah oh well fingers crossed it'll work uh, so let's take a little look. So power switch on the bottom there. We can turn our volume up a bit. Check sounds okay. All right, that's not ideal, is it? Not really what we were hoping for. Let's power down. Just double check I've got my batteries in the right way and everything's okay there. That's in position there. That's okay there. That's okay there. Battery in, a little wiggle, battery in, a little wiggle, make sure we've got a connection, and we'll give it another go. Hey! <laughs> oh, always nice to have a little bit of tension, isn't it? So yeah, I just hadn't quite seated the batteries correctly. Oh, thank goodness for that. Wow! Okay, that looks nice. Let's just grab my other one. I'll take a game cartridge out and boot up and we can just see the difference between, I mean, I don't know how much my camera is going to pick up, but side by side there, looking close up on the IPS, it is definitely brighter and clearer. There's a slight grey tint to the um, ITA screen. I mean, side by side, they look great. Size wise, let's just check. So the original screen is 60 mil wide and the IPS is a little bit bigger, 62. Um, so it's, it's just a tiny bit bigger than the original one and the opening on the, on the lens is a bit bigger there too. You can see quite clearly, well, tell you what, my phone camera is all right until you start trying to look at things close up, but you can see like the individual pixels on this, uh, whereas this is not quite as defined on the pixels themselves, but the colours look good, the colours look vibrant. Right, there's a couple of other things we need to check first, now that we've got it working. Thank goodness we've got it working. So one of the, the real advantages with this is the viewing angles. So if we look at it from there, from there, from there, like it, there's basically, there's no washout at all. It looks perfect from every angle. It wasn't quite like that with the ITA. Don't get me wrong, I am a huge fan of the ITA screen. I think it looks great, but when you change your angles, it's, you slightly lose what you're seeing from certain points of view. It's not terrible. It's really, really good, and it looks a bit more authentic than this one in terms of the, the retro styling. But this video is all about the IPS and the advantages of that, and it's bright, it's vibrant, it's colourful, it's big, it looks awesome. Right, and those viewing angles are just perfect. It's time for a little look at what this thing can do. We've got an on-screen display function. So before, without having an on-screen display, what you could do is you could hold down select and then just tap on the left and right shoulder buttons to adjust the brightness whereas now you press and hold select it brings up this display and then you can press on the L and R to change your brightness all the way down to one in fact if you cycle up that's between the least bright and the brightest okay so we'll bring that down to say 10 okay and then we use the um, select button again it will go on to the next option which is clr which is color so one is standard color two is highlight three is classic green and four is classic gray <laughs> okay that's what it said on the instructions but i'm thinking three is classic gray and four is classic green the classic green i am gonna have to grab a tetris cartridge to uh, try this out within a bit um, but let's just go back to one which is standard color two is highlights a little bit brighter uh, then we'll go on to um, our select button again we'll go dsp which is display mode and you can have standard mode which is one you can have anti-aliasing, which kind of smooths out all of the pixels, which is two. Or you can have pixel mode, which is three, which looks much more like the display of the TFT screen. So really, you've got the best of both worlds with this one. It's not quite as crisp as the TFT, but it does look pretty good. 
If you're one of those people who likes putting fake scan lines on things, then you'll enjoy that feature. But let's just go back to select. I'm going to go on color one display. Um, I'm going to just put that back to the standard one there. And we've also got FRM, which is frames, and you can have frames off or on. I'm not entirely sure what that means, so we'll come back to that in a bit. I tell you what, if we try it with a game, all of this will probably make more sense. And fortunately, my favourite game for testing, Street Fighter 2, I have two copies of this, which means we'll be able to do some good side-by-side -side comparisons with the um, two consoles. Let's just turn that volume down a moment. And I'll put the other one into me, purple one, and we'll compare that in a little bit as well, booting up the same game. It's quite good for some side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, another thing I'm noticing is that the screen is currently covered with my fingerprints. So I'll just give that a little bit of a clean before I do any more. Right, that's a bit better. Let's just take a moment to appreciate the colour scheme I chose. Last time I got a really flashy purple one with purple buttons and all the rest I was all excited this time so yeah with the black and white scheme I was thinking is it just going to be a bit dull a bit boring but it actually looks really nice gives it quite a premium feel uh right so here we go that is our main title screen and doesn't it look good um yeah and then we've got the game loaded up on the demo mode Again, we've got these incredible viewing angles. Like I'm trying to get it so that it just disappears from view, but it is perfect from every angle. And this is where we can try out some of our other features with the select button. Um, so if we just bring up to our main screen, uh, select there. So we've got brightness uh, on 10 at the moment. So we'll put that up, all the way up to 15. Uh, we'll go on the color modes. So we've got one, two which was like the highlight mode which is a little bit of a brighter screen or we've got black and white or we've got the green screen look at that it's like proper old school this this is like the publicity shots for the original game boy games when uh, the original game boy came out i quite like that touch there with the green screen it is really good do you know what despite the odd frustration in the middle of installing this i am really really liking it really really liking it okay so we'll press and hold select again um we'll go i keep forgetting it's not the d-pad we'll go back to color and just bring that to the standard setting we'll go to the display so the standard mode which is what we're on here um or we've got the sorry anti-aliasing which is there not i mean if you look at the wings of the plane in the background um that's thankfully now gone out of view. Okay, let's look for an edge on the next bit. So the Capcom logo there, that's with the anti-aliasing, just smooths out. So without, with, smooths it all out. And then we've got the um, pixel mode, which is the third one. So that's with pixel mode. That's without, it just sort of smooths out the image of the picture. The pixel mode, very, very similar to the TF screen. So again, I'm going to go with the standard. And then with the frame off or frame on, I am not sure what's going on with that. I think it's probably to do with the frame rate and, you know, trying to get it so that you don't end up with the slight judder on certain games. I can't remember what the key games are that have those sort of issues. But yeah, there is there is that. So yeah, and then when you want that display to go away, it'll go away after a certain time or you just press select for a little while again and that will go off. So let's do a little bit of side by side comparison. So between the two, the IPS definitely looks the most modern. It's, it's so bright and clear and bold. Having that on screen display and being able to adapt things. I wasn't sure if I was going to be won over. I was really quite taken with the sort of original authentic feel of the ITA screen, which I'm still a big fan of, but really this, <laughs> it looks more modern, but I think it's it's better for it. it. It looks so nice. And with that crisp screen and everything else, yeah. It, do you know what? What an amazing situation for us all to be in, in that there are two options, and there's more options as well that we'll we'll come to it, you know, in other videos. But that there are these two options that are both so good, and that you get to choose between them. Like when I first started doing backlit Game Boys, there was no way of getting a you know 
a lit screen on a Game Boy Advance. So to be able to do this and have so many options, we're all winners. Yeah, when you compare like this lens, which is a glass lens as well, so it's really quick and easy to clean and polish, and you compare it to like the original like that, where you had slight gap around the edge, it was plastic, it'd pick up scratches. It's a world of difference. Wow, look at that. This, well, that's my Christmas sorted. I'm gonna just be sitting and playing Game Boy games. Okay, so not quite as straightforward a job as I was imagining it was gonna be, but wow, it's worth it. Told you I'd try the Tetris cartridge. How good does that look with the green screen? <laughs> Having that on-screen display option, I really like. Um, it adds an extra level of functionality, a bit more customization, and it feels like you, yeah. I don't know, it's just quite exciting having those kind of options on an old bit of hardware like this. Um, I think that both this and the TFT screen have a place. It depends on your personal preference. If you like a modern, bright, vibrant, larger display, uh, then definitely go for the IPS. If you want it to look a little bit more authentic, a little bit more in keeping with the era of the console and the games, the TFT screen is hard to beat. The pixel finish is perfect because that is the actual function of the screen. That's how it operates. The pixel on this looks good, but when you really closely inspect it, there is a difference between the two. But for most people, you're not really gonna notice. This one's got the versatility because you can swap between the pixel display and the bright, vibrant, clear display and different colors and all the rest of it. It is kind of cool. Having to buy the specific funny playing shell is gonna put some people off. Um, but it does make the job easier. No cutting, no messing about with the Dremel and trimming and all the rest of it. I like that. More like this, please. Um, but it was a bit fiddly. Partly down to the instructions that I got from the website of Funny Playing. I actually printed them off. Remember printers? I told you I was retro. Um, but I printed them off, so I thought I will follow it and I'll follow that sequence. But to be honest, they weren't that helpful. They make great kits. They make really good products. Well, their instructions are a little bit lacking. So hopefully my video will help in terms of those instructions. I know I made a few mistakes along the way. I missed a few steps and had to backtrack a little bit. I'll try and edit so we've got a sequence that makes some sense. If it makes some sense, please let me know if there's some issues with it. Again, I don't mind. Constructive feedback is always good. I'm always trying to get better. So if you enjoyed it, I'll shut up. I'm going to go and play this. Leave a like, uh, comment if you've got something to say about it. And... Um, yeah, please do subscribe. We're on the way to 5K. I never thought I'd get this far. So thank you. Thank you for all of your support. I know I've had a bit of a gap in terms of production lately, but I'm trying to ramp that up and build up a bit more content and keep going. So this is the one I've really been looking forward to. And it's just, oh, it's so been worth it. It's so been worth it. So see you on the next video. Uh, thanks for all your support. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go and play some Game Boy Advance. Bye.